Thank you, choir. Thank you, Mrs. Carricker. I offer an opinion. Some of you are thinking, what else is new? And here's my opinion. It is very difficult for me to believe that a person could be genuinely converted without some appreciation of the majesty and might of God, without some feeling of the fear of God and the dread of him, is then usually surrounded by mostly unsaved people pretending to be Christians. And this happens in so many congregations. What do newborn babes in Christ know about anything? Not much. Not much. Now, Christians and immature Christians have so little discernment, according to Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14, not being able to discern right from wrong. Serving God, they just assume that what they see is the right way to worship and to serve. The tragic impact that unbelievers pretending to be Christians can have on a babe in Christ runs deep. It can take decades to correct misapprehensions and misunderstandings that new Christians get about worshiping, serving God from those unbelievers they are initially exposed to. I am, I think, I think I'm living testimony that wrong lessons the entire building. As a babe in Christ with no discernment whatsoever, I learned how to worship God and how to serve God in that less than optimal environment. So what did I learn? I learned that worship of God should always be preceded with laughter and frivolity. No one needs to be serious about serious things. That's what I learned. I learned that Christians should be lighthearted and frivolous when serving God. And I learned silliness for joy and spiritual delight. I learned that children must always be made to laugh and that youth workers and children's workers should always be jokers and engage in mindless banter with their class. I learned that you must always have a time of fun and game, laughter and jokes before you turn people's attention to the gravely serious matters of sin and death and hell and eternity and the wrath of God and the salvation which is in Jesus Christ. When I contemplate my ministry, especially just before I come out of my office and as I'm sitting there before it's my turn on the platform, and though God tenderly reminds me of my weakness and dependency just before I mount the platform, I'll have to admit that those misguided lessons I learned early on in my Christian life still bubble to the surface. I find myself some of you in need of your forgiveness. I ask you to allow me this morning to alter the direction of your worship, to alter somewhat the inclination of your service to God so that it might be more meaningful, so that it might be more pleasing to God, and so that it might be more real. I find in the Word of God that real worship of God, not just going through the motions while being silly and irreverent, is a fearful and dreadful thing. King David wrote in Psalm 5 and verse 7, and the sweet psalmist of Israel knew what he was talking about. He wrote, but as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. 
Before that, in Psalm 2, verse 11, he wrote, Serve the Lord with fear. Our worship and service is to the same God David worshipped, the same God David served, amen? Therefore, if in response to the limited revelation of God, he had recognized the propriety of fearing Almighty God when worshiping and serving Him, how much more ought we to recognize the same propriety? Much is made these days of so-called praise music. And great attention is paid in some churches to what they like to call worship. However, I want you to consider the effect of contemporary praise services on people's attitudes toward God. How does the music affect them? The gods, who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. Does contemporary worship provoke that kind of a response? Does does it inspire in you? Does it inspire fear and awe and terror? None of the contemporary services I've ever been to had such an effect on me or the people that I noticed in the auditorium. So let us recognize that rejoicing before the Lord is an integral part of praise and worship. But how much thought and attention has been given to David's directive that we rejoice with trembling? Psalm 2, verse 11. Unlike how I was taught, and too oftentimes unlike the examples I may have inadvertently set for you, all of our service to God, every part of it, ought to be done with reverence and godly fear. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28 reads, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. I pray that God will give you grace this morning to serve him with godly fear. However, there may be needed an intermediate step for you to take. To that end, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perhaps you need to cleanse yourself this morning, Christian. Take a little bit of a bath. This is accomplished by separating from people and practices that are unclean. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 through chapter 7, verse 1. It is accomplished by the Savior for cleansing an entire congregation using the word of God. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26. It is accomplished by drawing closer to God. James chapter 4 verse 8. And it is accomplished by our ongoing acknowledgement of personal sin and continual the continual forgiveness of our sins by God. 1 John chapter 1 verses 7, 8, and 9. The question is, what moves a Christian to fear God so that we will separate from sinful practices and people so that we will not stay home when we might have been congregationally cleansed through the word of God being preached and taught so that we might draw closer to God in our personal walk so that we might understand, appreciate it, and respond to the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ. What makes the worship of God such a fearful thing to the child of God? Being tutored by 
John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, let me suggest to you this morning four considerations that motivate the clean Christian to serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. First, there is the majesty of God. All responsible service rendered to someone carries with it a dread and fear that corresponds to the quality, to the character, or the station of the person being served. Whether in the job, at a club, in a church, standing before a governor or the president, that's, it's always that way. Unless someone is a fool, and there are lots of those, he doesn't need to be told to attend to the service of a king or to the president of the United States with dread and fear. He just already knows that. Why? Because he's not stupid. Because he's not an idiot. There is an inborn awareness in human beings that the more prominent, the more powerful, the more important an individual is, the more fear and dread should be associated with serving him. This is why parents who are competent and wise raise their children in such a way that they will carefully and cautiously attend to the chores and duties assigned to them by their parents. It's a foolish child of negligent parents who has no fear of serving his parents carelessly. Never crossed my mind to do what my daddy told me to do carelessly. Never crossed my mind, I promise you. Even less likely was it to cross my mind to fool my mother carelessly, because she tended to be more, more concerned about such things than even my dad was. Consider then worship and service rendered to God. Since God himself is fearful and dreadful, since God himself is awesome and terrible, it only stands to reason that real worship and service given to him by a servant who is competent and who is intelligent and who is knowledgeable will be service and worship that is fearful and dreadful. Otherwise, you don't know who you're dealing with. You just don't know who you're dealing with. It is the ignorant Christian who does not approach his ministry of ushering with caution and concern. It is the foolish Christian who does not prepare and pray for her singing in the choir with apprehension and careful preparation. It is the ill-trained teacher or evangelist who does not tremble a bit as he attends to his task of communicating God's truth to others. This is serious business. Yes, it is the majesty of the God we serve that cautions our fear and our dread, for with God is terrible majesty, Job 37 and verse 22. Next, there is the presence of God. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20 reads, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. To be sure, this verse specifically applies to the prayers of church members reconciling a church member to the cause of Christ who has strayed. But can it be far off the mark in describing the Lord Jesus Christ's close association with any activity that seeks the reconciliation of people to God? We have been given a ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18. We seek not the physical presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, either in our service or in any sinner's heart, knowing that the Savior sits at the Father's right hand in heaven during his present session, and he's there to be our advocate. He's there to be our intercessor. But do we not want his special blessing on our activities? 
Do we not want him here by virtue of his representative, the precious Holy Spirit of God? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. As well, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, the Lord Jesus Christ there described himself as walking in the midst of the golden candlesticks, which study shows to represent churches like ours. What an amazing thing then that he whose hairs were like white wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, should be in an unfathomable way in our midst. Revelation chapter 1 verses 14 and 15. Or, or perhaps it's just me. Described in Revelation chapter 1 and verse and, and chapters 1 and 2 as a star, when I read that he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Revelation chapter 1 verse 16. Wow. Perhaps some of us are more motivated by this than others. But should we not be struck with fear and dread that God the Father or the Son of God through the ministry and person of the Holy Spirit should answer our prayers and be somehow present in our midst when we worship and when we serve? I say yes. Third, there is the jealousy of God. We have been groomed to think that all jealousy is wrong. And indeed, all jealousy is wrong, except when God is jealous. Except when God is jealous. Jealousy, you see, is when a person is intolerant of unfaithfulness or rivalry. And when a friend of yours shows kindness toward another and you become jealous, when you feel wronged that your friend has been friendly to another, then you commit sin because your friend is supposedly or should actually and is supposed to be friendly toward others and not just you. We ought to be happy when a friend is a friend to others and not just us. But sometimes we're not happy and we get jealous. So what happens when you are, on the other hand, unfaithful toward God? What happens when you turn your attentions from God to a rival for your affections and loyalties other than God? It is no accident, my friend, that God's self-description as a jealous God is found in that one of the Ten Commandments that deals with worship. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5 reads, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the third, upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Wow. As concerned as God is about any display of unfaithfulness and rivalry for his affections, he is most concerned about such displays during worship and during service. Be careful then how you worship God. Be careful then how you go about your service to God. Truly, the thought of God's jealousy kindled because in church you wish you were somewhere else because while singing, your thoughts are on play, ought to fill you with fear and dread. If you have any understanding of the God with whom you have to do, you will recognize this. What about your children? A seasoned Christian woman told me once, maybe a year ago, maybe 18 months ago, because it had always perplexed me. But this seasoned Christian woman, this was the her mother had been a wonderful Christian. Her grandmother had been a wonderful Christian. She's a wonderful Christian. Her daughters are wonderful Christians and moms. 
None of them is a pushover. None of them is a weak sister. They're all women of very of strength and, and personal fortitude. And she once told me that the struggle with children for proper conduct during worship is a battle that is won or lost at home. What? She told me that children should be trained by their mothers at home. That when the Bible is open, you are to calm down, you are to sit down, and you are to be quiet. Play again. Slow down. Play again. Slow down. So she said, when such children come into the auditorium or onto the church place, they have been trained at home how they are to behave during public worship. Properly attend to that at home, she told me, and the problem of misconduct in the church house will evaporate. Oh, the benefit to the children of being properly trained at home to adopt the proper attitude at church. And finally, there are the judgments of God. Nadab and Abihu were burned to death with fire from heaven because they attempted to offer strange fire on God's altar. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. You say, why? God said that he would be sanctified by those who come close to him. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3. God judged those men as they served him. They were serving him improperly when he brought fire from heaven upon them. And he said, I'm not going to tolerate that from you. Remember when David ordered the Ark of the Covenant moved from Shiloh, it was moved on a cart instead of being borne on shoulders as God had decreed. When the oxen stumbled and the ark threatened to tip out of the, ark, uh, out of the cart, Uzzah reached out to keep the ark from falling. Now what did God do? He slew Uzzah. First Chronicles chapter 13, verses 9 and 10. You say, why? Uzzah touched that which he was forbidden to touch. He was judged while serving God for serving God improperly. You say, well, I don't think that's fair. No one cares what you think on this issue. No one cares what I think on this issue. What matters are the truths about God's judgments toward those who serve him. That's what matters. As well, he slew Ananias and Sapphira because they lacked the fear and dread of God's majesty, God's name, and God's service when they came before him and lied, Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. So he struck them both down for their lack of reverence at the communion of the Lord's Supper Paul informs us that a number of the Corinthian congregational church members died. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 30 through 32. Imagine, slain by God for having fun at the communion service and not being sufficiently reverent. God doesn't tolerate clown shows. So what do we learn from what we have considered? We should learn that warning has been given to three kinds of people. First, warning has been given to those who do not worship or serve God at all. If God judges those who serve him wrongly and without reverence, imagine what must be in store for those who worship him not at all. Second, warning has been given to you who think that just showing up on Sundays is sufficient. Understand that God is concerned about the state of your mind and heart as well as the location of your body. What a sad accounting sum we'll have to give. 
because you come here not to worship with fear and dread, but for some other reason known only to yourself. And finally, warning has been given to you who do not care how you worship God. You just don't care. Perhaps you have created God in your image and after your likeness, and your God is not a God to be feared and dreaded. I say this to you, someday you will find out what God is really like. Earlier, I quoted Job 37 and verse 22, with God is terrible majesty. I might also bring to your attention Psalm 24 or t- Psalm 29 and verse 4. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. There are many other passages in God's word that call attention to God's majesty. So we might ask, what is majesty that it should so impress a person that it should inspire such awe and reverence that it should evoke outright fear and dread, this thing called majesty. The Hebrew word for majesty has to do with exaltation. It has to do with being lifted up. It has to do with being excellent. It has to do with splendor. It also has to do with beauty. The prophet Isaiah used the phrase, the glory of his majesty, three times in Isaiah chapter 2 alone, to mean something like the splendor of his majesty or the magnificence of his beauty. God overwhelms. The word majesty is one of those Bible words God uses to express something that is nigh unto inexpressible. To describe something that is really indescribable. To communicate something incommunicable. Perhaps it's better to show what a sinner ought to do when faced with God's majesty. I'd like for you, if you have a Bible or a Bible app in front of you, to turn to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 10, and stand for the reading of God's word, if you would be so inclined. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 10. Notice what it says. Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for the for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. Won't you please be seated? There is coming a day when you will be confronted with the majesty of Almighty God. When you will be faced with you will find yourself in the presence of the one who created you. What advice does the prophet Isaiah give to you for that day in which the lofty looks of man will be humbled And the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. In a phrase, run and hide. Say what? You heard me. Run and hide. Why must you run? You must run because you're being sought out by the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to Revelation chapter 6, verses 15, 16, and 17. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? The answer to the question, of course, is that no one will be able to stand in the great day of his wrath. No no one, whether you be young or old, whether you be rich or poor, bondman or free, prepared or unprepared. Some of you understand what I'm talking about. Others are, what's he saying? 
you will, you will run for all your worth to escape the wrath of the Lamb. You will run for all your worth to escape the vengeance of Jesus Christ. Understand, sinner, that the Lord Jesus Christ is not, he is not presently angry with you. At present, right now, he is patient and loving. He is compassionate and long-suffering, but there is coming a day when he will have had enough of your wickedness, when he will have had enough of your rebellion, when he will finally say, enough. When that day comes, the Lord Jesus will come back. And when he comes back, it will be to execute vengeance on his enemies and on those who have refused to bend the knee and bow the head and confess that he is Lord. But why will you be sought by the Lord Jesus Christ? You will run to find a place to hide because Jesus Christ is coming after you. Please do not misunderstand. At this present time, at this present time, Jesus has come to seek and to save that which is lost. His present desire is for you to turn from your sins and come to him for salvation full and free. But there is coming a day, the Bible teaches, there is coming a day when the Lord Jesus Christ's posture toward you will no longer be the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. The day is coming when he will come as the Lion of the tribe of Judah to execute wrath on his enemies to punish you. You say, well, I don't like that. Well, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So you will run because someone is after you. That someone who will be after you will not then mean you good but ill. He will not then seek you to save you but to apprehend you and bind you over for harsh judgment. He will cast you into hell. But why will Jesus then seek after you to apprehend you to punish you? Because you're a criminal. You have wronged heaven and you have sinned against God. And the sins you have committed are infinitely serious and they cry out for maximum possible penalty from God. So in a sense, you are a fugitive from the justice of God. And so desperate will you then be to escape the Lord Jesus Christ that you will cry for the mountains and the rocks to fall on you. But you will not succeed. He will find you and he will punish you with fire and brimstone. But where will you hide? You can do what most will try to do, which is to hide under rocks and in the mountains. This is what those who hear the gospel preach now, but who refuse to pay attention will have to do. When warned to flee from the wrath to come, most will laugh and mock and scorn and ridicule. Others of you will quietly smirk and chuckle to yourselves. You hide under social conventions and religion, under good deeds and good intentions. But what will happen to you when all of those things are stripped away under the gaze of him whose eyes are flames of fire? When the Son of God returns to this earth and when all pretense of sophistication is shown to you to be worthless and, and vain, when you are stripped naked and shown for what you really are, a wicked and deceitful sinner, then all you will be able to do is look for a place to run and hide into that basement. But it's already full of people up to the hills to conceal yourself in a gully, but behind every rock you find there are already too many people to hide. Ah, you finally found it, a deep tunnel left over from an old mine. And no one else has found it, so you run in and then you are walking in deeper and deeper and deeper into the bowels of the earth. As the tunnel gets smaller and smaller, you resort to crawling, ignoring the bruises and the lacerations, feeling no pain from the cuts on your hands and knees and, and, and the scrapes on your forehead and, 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 and 
caring nothing for the spiders and the bugs. Now you feel safe. But wait. There's a rumbling and deafening roar and all of a sudden the whole mountain above you is ripped away by a powerful angel and you are left completely exposed. And another holy angel puts his hand around your wrist like a vice and instantaneously takes you, his prisoner, halfway around the world where you are set before the one whose eyes are as flames of fire and whose feet are like fine brass and his hair white like wool as he sits before you. And suddenly out of his mouth proceeds a sharp two-edged sword and you are struck dead in an instant. And a bare second later you wake up screaming in, with torment in hell and there you will be until the great white throne judgment a thousand years later. You try to get away today by not thinking about your sins and God's judgment to come. Well, if I pre pretend it's not real, maybe it'll go away. It won't go away. You'll try to get away then by running and hiding. But in no case will you succeed. You who flee from Jesus are doomed. However, there are some very few others who resort to escaping by different means. These are the ones who take the advice of Isaiah, who told them, enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty, Isaiah 2.10. Will you be like the multitudes who seek safety in the rocks? Will you flee from the Lord Jesus Christ in that hour of judgment? Or will you be one of the few, one of the very few, with the wisdom to flee to the Lord Jesus Christ? Will you be one who seeks not to hide under the rocks, but one who seeks to hide from the wrath of God and who seeks to find safety in the rock, which is Jesus Christ? Isaiah says, enter into the rock. Understand, this means sinners should seek safety and refuge by entering into Jesus Christ. Turn from your sins and come to Jesus Christ and, and he will take you in. And from henceforth, you will be in Christ. The next phrase reads, and hide thee in the dust. This speaks of humility. God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. The proud will not bend his knee and bow his head and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He won't do it. What's your motive for seeking Christ? What's your motive for humbling yourself? The fear of the Lord and the glory of His majesty. Here you are, a wretched sinner, resisting and grieving the Holy Spirit who strives to woo you, and all of a sudden, you catch a glimpse of His glory, you comprehend His majesty just a little bit, and his splendor chills you so that you fear God for just a moment, the resistance to him, to him is melted away. You recognize what folly it is to resist so great and glorious a God as this. What monstrous sin is it to rebel against a God of such holiness? So in awe and terror and amazement and reverence and submission, you come to Jesus. Huh. That's what Isaiah would have you to do. That's what Jesus would have you to do. I've been told that a man was trekking through the highlands of Scotland when a storm broke upon him, running to find a place to hide from the cold wind and the lashing rain, the man ran toward an outcropping of rocks and came to a huge monolith. 
At the base of the huge monolith was a deep crack, a cleft in the rock, into which the man stepped and found perfect safety, warmth, and refuge from the storm. While standing there, out of the rain and away from the wind and in perfect comfort and safety, his mind settled on the Lord Jesus Christ, described in the Bible as our rock. The song Brother Eisenberger will soon come to lead us in singing seems like a fitting conclusion to this message because the song that man wrote was rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. I urge you to seek refuge from the coming storm of God's wrath. Not by trying to hide under the rocks and the mountains. Not trying to pretend like you're good. Ain't nobody good in this room, least of all me. Ain't no good people here. Okay, This is not a place for good people. Okay, They that are whole need not a physician. Amen? This is a room full of wretched people who need a Savior. Amen? Am I right? So, don't run into the rocks... Enter into the rock that is Jesus Christ and be saved. Let's stand for prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for your goodness. Pray that you might help us this morning, that you might speak to hearts and minds, that as we sing this verse of song, that men and women and young people would consider the urgency of their situation and they might flee not to the rocks and the hills and the caves to hide from you, but to flee to Jesus Christ, to come to you by coming to your Son for salvation full and free. Blessed to that end and help us as we prepare for this morning's baptismal service. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.